This is a Sega Katana dev kit, a tower that made dreams come true. Hello all and welcome back to the corner. 25 years ago, as of the release of this video, Sega released what would turn out to be their last games console, the Sega Dreamcast. It had a lot weighing on its shoulders, with some even speculating that neither it or even Sega would survive the first year. However, this video is not about the Dreamcast's bittersweet end of an era, but about the tool that went into making dreams, or rather, Dreamcast games. Although, if you would like to listen to a discussion about the Dreamcast, you might enjoy the Crosswires Legacy podcast. We've got all the electronics lined up, the cables coming up the bottom. But, sir, the players, they wanted to come and gather the bag. As, as someone looked at it goes, <laughs> what is the cheapest possible solution we have that doesn't involve re-engineering the entire controller? I know. Hand me that Dremel. <laughs> Bobby, you know you're a genius. <laughs> <laughs> a link to this podcast will be in the video description. From the front, it wouldn't look out of place next to some late 90s computers, except for maybe the switches, the front controller ports, and of course, the pop-out GD ROM drive. Whilst I don't know what the original cost from back in the day would have been, current prices for these units are very expensive, so once again I am very grateful for this being loaned to me by my friend Jupitris. On the back panel we will see a bunch of connectors, namely VGA, MIDI, S-Video and RCA Composite Video and Audio. Above that we have two SCSI 2 connectors, a pass-through for the GD Writer unit and an MDR68 connector labelled Extension I.O. Finally above that is an RS-232 connector, a modem connector and a strange DE9 port labelled C1 slash C2, of which the purpose I currently don't know. Now this unit is here for two reasons. One of which is so that we can have a look at, inside and using this tool complete the development environment. But the other is to verify that everything is in good working order. Now this tool uses a standard ATX power supply and knowing what I do of late 90s PC power supplies, it's probably best that we open this unit up just to make sure that there's no burst capacitors or leaking batteries. It also has an internal 4GB SCSI hard drive, which if there's any data on there should be archived. Now this is going to be a long video, so to help out with that, I have added chapters to this video which you'll be able to use to skip around to the various parts that you might be interested in, should you wish to do that. I also want to clarify a few things before continuing. First of all, this video is not going to be about how to fully set up or use the katana. I also won't be doing any coding or showing you how you would use the SDK tools outside of interacting with the katana. Further to that last point, I am not a game developer nor do I have any experience with the katana, I am just taking a look at the device, its accompanying software and having fun playing around with it. But with all of that intro out of the way, let's open it up. Here is a SCSI hard drive, a fast SCSI 50 pin 4GB hard drive made by Seagate. I'm removing it for now until we're ready to archive its contents. Once I had removed the rear screws for the power supply and unplugged both the GD ROM board and the main ATX connector, I tried to remove the PSU, but then I realised that the GD ROM drive section and thus also the main boards were in the way of some screws that I needed to remove as well. Well, I guess it'll just have to entirely come apart then. This board is the modem and RS-232 PCB. It needs to be removed first before I can remove the main PCB. As does the real audio video connector ribbon cable and the GD-ROM tray status cable, the front power switch cable, the dev kit settings cable and the front controller ports ribbon cable. Mm -hmm. 
The motherboard is a variant of the Dreamcast specifications, which has the same SH4 CPU, PowerVR GPU, and the Sega Yamaha Ica sound chip. Also present is the expansion I.O. port and a special version of the BIOS for this system. Now I'm curious if the expansion port is similar to the Dreamcast expansion port, or was it used for developing games for the Dreamcast's arcade sister, the Naomi, which has extra hardware for JVS and cabinet controls. To continue to remove the GD-ROM drive, I had to remove the top half of the case framework. With that off, we can have a look at this curious PCB. This is a GD-ROM emulator system which sits between the Katana motherboard and the GD-ROM drive and allows you to either load a game from the GD-ROM drive or use the internal 4GB SCSI hard drive. This board is very complex, consisting of dual SH2 CPUs, Xilinx and Altera FPGAs, dual SCSI controllers and a bunch of CPLDs and a small side of RAM. But this is perhaps understandable given the fact it has to read data from the hard drive and then convert that data into the GD-ROM format that the Dreamcast expects. As this board is also where you would connect your development PC to, it also needs to act as a SCSI device to the computer as well. I'm curious to learn why there are two SCSI buses however. Perhaps one is just for the drive emulator and the other is for the Dreamcast system, but I'm not sure. Continuing with our disassembly, we can remove the GD-ROM drive and finally remove the ATX power supply. And if you're curious, the rear I.O. panel is effectively a breakout board, just extending the I.O. from the motherboard. The same can be said for a controller port PCB. Now whilst I don't need to take apart the GD-ROM drive section, I thought it prudent to check for any leaking SMD capacitors. And I'm also just too curious. Under the shielding we can find the drive controller, which is very interesting. It's using an OTI922 chip, which looking at the datasheet says it's a CD-ROM drive controller with an IDE interface. Now CD-ROM makes sense as the GD-ROM format is very closely based off of CD-ROM, just using a section of the disc where the data lands and pits are spaced much closer together to get the higher density that's required to make up the 1GB storage capacity. However, I'm more intrigued by the IDE part, as that means that the drive emulator is also speaking IDE to the Katana motherboard, which means it's not only converting the hard drive data to a GD-ROM image, it's also converting from SCSI to IDE. No wonder it needs the same hardware as the Sega Saturn in there. This board is also what the C1-C2 port on the back is for. It's a debug interface for the CD-ROM controller error correction system, which might be useful for when you're using the GD-ROM writer system. Finally, there is the GD-ROM tray, however it might be readily apparent that this mechanism is the exact same drive mechanism used by both the Dreamcast and the Naomi GD-ROM system. Also, as a side note, whilst using SCSI 2 connectors, the Naomi GD-ROM system, in fact all systems using the GD-ROM drive, use the same IDE interface, which is why it's also possible to use compact flashcards on these arcade systems as GD-ROM drive replacements, provided you have the correct firmware installed. And no, these drives are not standard IDE drives, they will not work in computers. Trust me, I tried. Several years ago. It didn't work. All it did was make the IDE controller hang, as the drives don't support the add to drive information commands. With the Katana all taken apart and spread across the desk, you can see just how complex this system is. We have the main Dreamcast based dev board, the GD-ROM drive emulator and SCSI interface board, GD-ROM controller PCB, the modem card, and the debug controls PCB. Wait, why did we take it apart again? Just because we could? After taking apart the ATX power supply for a visual inspection, I didn't see any signs of bad caps leaking or not, so I moved on to test the voltage levels to be sure. I'm using two ultra SCSI hard drives just to load down the 5 and 12 volt rails during the test as some power supplies won't show correct readings if you don't do this. The 5 volt rail read 5.15 volts which might be a tiny bit high but it is within spec and it also might go lower when the katana is running. The 12 volt is reading for 11.2 volts which is a little low but seeing as the system is only using the 12 volts for fans and mechanical parts it's probably fine. I also checked the 3.3V, the minus 12V and the minus 5V lines, all of which read normally even if unloaded. However, the latter two are probably completely unused in the Katana. 
And just to preempt the question or even demand that I recap this power supply because it's good practice, it's just an ATX power supply. It's far easier and better to just replace it if it was even slightly bad. With the power supply tested and my confidence in it being what it is, I reinstalled the PSU and started to put the unit back together. Now let's turn our attention to that Seagate SCSI hard disk drive. It's an ST34555N hard drive with a capacity of 4GB. Now I have heard that the hard drive size has to be 4GB exactly, or at least no bigger than 4GB, otherwise the GD-ROM emulator will not use it. I'd imagine there's a firmware reason for this, and probably due to the fact it will only be expecting a driver of a certain size. But I also don't want to install it back into the Katana just yet, as I want to try to archive what's on the drive whilst it's out of the machine, just to avoid any interference or variables in the process. Now SCSI, whilst used on a lot of computers and servers, this means archiving it using modern systems can be tricky as USB to SCSI is not nearly as common as USB to IDE. Now whilst these do exist, I don't currently own one and I don't have any other fancier method, so instead I'm going to be using this external SCSI enclosure and this Compact Desk Pro EN as my tool. The external enclosure will power the drive and provide an interface to allow me to connect the drive to the Compact PC. Right, so we're ready to go. I have my Pentium 3 uh, Compact Desk Pro EN ready to go. Will you stop doing that light? Yeah, the backlight might be flickering. I hope it's not gonna do that too frequently. So the only difference that I've done is I've uh, taken out the uh, zip drive from my SCSI box or SCSI enclosure, and I've just replaced it with a generic uh, three and a half inch to five and a quarter inch drive bay. And the only reason I've done that rather than using the setup before where I had it, the hard drive on a box is because this unit has already um, shocked me once before. And when I say shocked, I mean with 240 volts AC. The power on switch at the back, it's insulated except for like one or two mil of the switch. And every time I was reaching around the back, I could sometimes catch it. So well, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to boot Clonezilla is what I'm going to use to actually make a backup of the drive. I've got it on this really tiny 64 gig memory stick and I'm going to boot off this because I do have a CD drive. I could burn the CD, but I've lost my CD burner somewhere in the mess that is this studio. But this PC doesn't boot off of USB natively. So what we're going to use is a primary boot loader stage, which is plop. I love Plop, it's a great boot manager. Um, basically, if you've got a BIOS system or you know an old system like this, this will basically let you boot off of pretty much anything, provided it is bootable. So what we're gonna do is we're going to then save the image onto this 32 gigabyte compact flash card. Uh, this was one that I originally I was going to use for an Xbox modding video. And what does BST stand for? Well, depending on your interpretation, it either stands for basic service tools or blood, sweat and tears. Let's get our flappy and we'll put it in. And this is going to be genuinely the first time that I've turned on this hard drive. Um, I've wanted to turn it on for ages, but when you've got a drive that you don't know, especially when it's a SCSI drive, there's always the chance that when you power it up, that may be the last time you ever power it up. So I wanted to do this all in one shot and then make sure I've got a working image before I turn it off, just so that if it does die, we've not lost anything. Anyway, let's see if it works. Ooh, 
I don't know how much of that you heard, but that doesn't sound uh, promising. Okay, I thought it was terminated. So unfortunately I'm going to have to power this off, and the reason I say unfortunately is because again, that drive doesn't sound healthy, but it might already be dead, so. So I'm just screwed in the drive. Can you see the problem? Cool! So it turns out, termination power was enabled, but the terminator on the drive itself wasn't, but Sega removed the jumper. A note from editing Nihuki, don't use Clonezilla to archive these drives, or if you do, at least force it to make a raw drive image instead. What Clonezilla did is see that it had a FAT16 file system, and whilst it did back up the drive contents, it didn't save any unused or deleted files, files and data that's not stored within the file allocation table, which could have been recovered by using special tools. I only realised it was missing this data when I was checking the backup files out. With that said, I doubt there was much data that would have been lost, if anything at all, but it's still always better to check your backups thoroughly first. I would have re-imaged the drive, but as you will see later in the video, I had already tried to remake an image to get the drive's content bootable. I would have used a spare drive to do this, but I don't own a spare SCSI HDD or working emulator. And just so that people are clear, I have actually enabled the write protect. Um, there's, so on some SCSI drives you have a write protection um, jumper, I have enabled it on this one. So this is going to be the bit that takes the longest. That was fast. Way faster than I was expecting. Which makes me think there wasn't much on there, if anything at all. Um, so regardless of what files it does have on there, we are safe that if the drive fails, we don't need to worry about it. Right, with the drive dumped, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change the setup so that we can have the Katana on the right-hand side. It's going to have its own little screen and speakers. We'll have the Windows 98 machine on the other side, and we'll try to get it so you can see both. Um, although, I just want to reiterate the points I made at the start of the video, which is I'm not going to go into the whole development side and how things work because I don't honestly know about it. This is just a look into the Katana dev kit and the setup, as it were, so... Well, with the drive archive, for what hassle it was worth anyway, I went and reinstalled the hard drive back into the Katana and put the cover back on. What we want to look at now is connecting the PC up to the Katana, and as far as I'm aware, you need to use SCSI port B. Now, this is the SCSI port that is connected to the hard drive as well as the GD-ROM emulator. And you connect your PC up here. So, what I've got here is a SCSI 2 cable, which is, funny enough, my uh, Sega Naomi uh, GD-ROM system. And we'll put one end in here, and we'll put one end up here. And now I need to find a SCSI Terminator. Several months later. My kingdom for a bigger table. So I had a look around and it turns out I didn't have any SCSI 2 Terminators. So after a couple of months, I now have four. My friend ordered one and then two, and then the other one didn't turn up. So I ordered two and now all of them have turned up. Anyway, so these two SCSI terminators are for the back of the Katana and these are going to go on to the SCSI A port, no sorry, SCSI B port and the GD Writer port. So I'm going to put those on because otherwise it won't boot. So we have the Katana hooked up to the Compact Desk Pro. The Desk Pro is running Windows 98. Um, the SCSI connections are hopefully all right. Um, we've got the Katana also connected up to this Dell monitor over VGA. I think this is to do with region and this is to do with video. So I'll have to check to make sure I've got the right video output, otherwise we won't see anything. I've got these two speakers hooked up to it so we can hear the sound output. Uh, this monitor is hooked up to the Compact, and I do have a Dreamcast controller that I'll plug in right now, actually. Yeah, just your standard issue Dreamcast controller. is a bit dusty, but it'll do. 
Right, so what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to power on the Compaq and then we'll install the software for the Katana. Right, about five or so hours later, I've finally got on Windows 98 booted. Um, for whatever reason, the Compact flash card I did have stopped working. So I then tried to reinstall it onto another Compact flash. This one, well, it worked, but then it ran out of space because there's only 512 megabytes on there. So the third install of Windows 98 and we finally have a working system. So this is just a fresh install of Windows 98 at the moment. There's no other software in there. I also had to change the monitor out because yeah, the other monitor stopped working. Um, but yeah, there's no software on here at the moment. So why don't we go ahead and install the SDK first of all. And then after that, we'll put on the, uh, what was that? CE toolkit, Windows CE toolkit. Okay, there's no autoplay on that one, I guess. Oh, where's my drive? Where's my CD drive? Oh, why? Be right back. Right, so the IDE controller for some reason needed to be reinstalled, but... Well, this is going to take a while to install, it seems. Ah, it's done. I was uh, sorting out my VMU so that the uh, time and date was working on it. Right, so that's the SDK installed. Let's have a look at the other disk, which is the CE Toolkit. Ooh. Uh, right, I guess we need to install... Oh. Right, well, I guess that would make sense. Well, let's install this, because I'm not going to be programming anything on the Dreamcast dev kit, so let's just... Uh, because I'm not going to be programming anything on the dev kit, I'm just going to be having a look at the tools, so... Cool. So that's the SDK installed. Okay, so let's have a look. So it's saying to connect the dev box like so. So we've got the SCSI Terminator on port A. We've got the SCSI Terminator for the GD-ROM drive here. If you have one, yep. Yeah. And then I've got the SCSI connecting this PC to the dev kit. Um, cool, yeah, so that's correct. Oh, let's have a look at the settings. So it's talking about these settings here. So this is obviously the flash write protect. This is the region and then this is the video information. So we've got that set to VGA. This is currently set to PAL because I've got PAL stuff and this is on normal operation. Okay, so that looks good to me. Right, well, I'm not gonna say no to turning the dev kit on. I'm curious to see. So the way that this is set up at the moment is that the VJ monitor here is connected to the Katana. I have got these speakers connected, so I'm going to turn those on. They are not plugged in. Let me go plug them in. All right, so let's turn the volume down because I'm not sure how loud this is going to be. And I guess we'll turn it on and see what happens. I'll be honest, I was expecting a uh, boot animation, but maybe that's what the software is going to do. Okay, yeah, so this is saying that it can't connect and it might be because the, um, it could be two reasons. One is because I'm expecting it to have come up with the animation logo and I've not seen that. But I'm also wondering if maybe it's because the SCSI card hasn't picked up the fact that it's got a um, dev box attached to it. So let's reboot the PC to see if that'll help. Okay, so we've got the Katana dev kit and we've got a GD drive. So that was the GD emulator drive. So that's good. That means it's all working. At least the emulator PCB is working. Definitely getting hard drive activity. Right, 
Right, that's interesting. So it's still not doing anything. And I'm wondering if that's because the katana is not actually booting up. Also, we're not seeing the uh, a secondary disc. I'm not sure if I have to install any drivers for the katana dev kit. After struggling for a while to understand what was going on, I followed the centuries old advice of RTFMing. I double checked my SCSI connections and made sure I had the SCSI termination set up correctly. Then, after a reboot of the Katana and the PC in that order... It does come up and say, DevBox is connected, which is good. So it is booting. So we click on continue. And for some reason I get this, setup cannot reset the Dreamcast DevBox. Um, and it says you might need to reboot whilst the DevBox is turned on. So I'll do that because it is at least trying to work. Now we're still getting that error message, but I, I'm not sure if I need to worry about this because from the manual it suggests that when you are going through this, it's reinstalling the firmware for the dev kit. But this was a unit that was already in use, so the firmware should already be there and flashed onto the system. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna exit out that and I believe that's the case because if we open this Codescape debugger uh, this wouldn't open before but it is opening now so it's definitely communicating with the um, Dreamcast dev kit and this is a very interesting system it gives you all of the um, assembly the SH4 assembly instructions as they're being executed which is quite cool um, but really what I want to see is I want to see that um, I wanted to see a few things. One, I wanted to see that boot logo, that special boot animation. Two, I want to know what's on this disc because it's unlabeled, um, but it is recorded onto. And I wanted to see whether or not you could boot into actual Dreamcast games. So I've got a few Dreamcast games here uh, and I wanted to see if they would boot on it. I I'd imagine they wouldn't, but just a bit of fun really. If I go run all, what happened? Ooh. Oh, I'm so happy now. <laughs> so that's all it was. Yeah, you just have to connect into it. And um, I'd imagine the internal battery is probably a bit past it. Cool. So this just looks like your standard Dreamcast um, BIOS menu, but it's just got a different boot. Um, animation but everything else is the same so you can see my uh, files that are on the um, VMU so I'm curious now if I add put in a disc a standard Dreamcast game let's go with Gauntlet Legends because why not what happens I'd imagine not a lot I'd also imagine because I've got it booted into um, the Japanese region it's not going to register the game Right, so let's see, what does it do? No, it doesn't like that. Okay, let's change it into PAL, which is done by changing this switch to nine, or reboot. Oh, do we have to click OK, like to run it on here as well? Um, execution run all. Oh yeah, it's in blue now. Because we're now in the European region and we had to have a different... Oh, it does boot games. Oh, that's cool. So that's... So at the moment, I've got the most um, over-the-top Dreamcast. Like, this is so extra. Admittedly not the greatest of games, but it's interesting nonetheless. So, so let's boot out of there. Okay, so now we know that the um, Dreamcast will boot. Now I think I have to constantly tell it to actually load up the BIOS though, which is annoying. That would make sense because I tried before before I'd installed any software, I did turn it on. Um, this is before I'd actually got my Terminators and it still didn't boot up. So I wonder 
you, like, you have to have the PC always connected. It will not boot if the PC is not connected because it won't be ever told to start executing, which would make sense, but it is, I don't know, a bit annoying. You can't just turn it on and play games on it, I guess. I want to see now what's on this disc. I also don't know what region this is, so I'm assuming it's the European region, but I'm not sure. Well, it's not happy with it, so let's change the region to, I don't know, let's go to the Japanese region. I don't expect it would be. So at the moment the Dreamcast dev kit is frozen, but what I'm doing is basically going into the debug and execution uh, menu and then clicking run all so that allows me to you know if I was actually running a program be able to step in because I can go execution I can stop and I can debug it uh, by running by step so every you'll see on the if I hold down F7 we will get a very slow frame rate but we will get it um, so I would absolutely love to talk to someone who actually did use Codescape or the Dreamcast development software because it seems like such a fascinating program. I mean, I'd imagine for game developers it's probably run of the, run of the mill, but for someone like me who's never got to play around with stuff like this, this is fascinating to be honest with you. So when you do a hard reset, it's it pauses execution. So I'd imagine that's so that you can get all of your debugging tools set up and ready. So to start execution, you press Control F9. I believe. Control F9. No. Or was it just F9 I press? And will this boot into a game? No. So is there anything on that disc? So one of the other things that you would be able to use with Codescape is the ability to uh, either load a program file straight into the memory of the Dreamcast or to load a binary file such as if you needed to load stage data or something like that into the memory uh, to test um, and then you could run it and go through doing all the debugging. Now I did download a couple of files to hopefully run but unfortunately what happens is when I try to load them, even if I try to just load the binary only, for example, um, it'll up to load it and then it'll say it doesn't work. And it's one of those things where, because it doesn't work, if I try to force it into running, it just goes straight into the BIOS. So unfortunately I can't get that working. Um, I'm sure there's something I'm not doing right here, but, but I'm no expert and I'm just having to play around, so. So you can kind of understand how that side of it would work. Um, I still would like to see this GD Workshop working, but I can't get that to work because it just won't. It does, for some reason, the hard drive isn't being detected. Um, now, I did read the manual and what the hard drive is, the hard drive is supposed to have two FAT16 partitions. Uh, one, I'm guessing like they're both for the GD ROM images, um, but I think what's happening is the drive, it has got, it is formatted, but it also doesn't appear in my Windows um, computer and it's supposed to. It's supposed to show up as a removable drive. And it's not like I haven't uh, messed around with the IDs or anything like that. It just, it just doesn't show up. Um, if you go into, we only get the Katana dev kit itself. We don't get any extra disk drives or anything like that, which is a shame. Here's something that does work though. This is the Dreamcast tool. Um, and what it seems to do is boot Windows CE on the dev kit. And then you get a Windows CE shell. So we'll do that. Connect to the Dreamcast. This will download the CE program into the G the memory. And if you see it's rebooting now. This does take a while to boot, so I'll skip ahead. Right, so you won't see anything on screen, but now we do have a shell on the um, program. And I don't actually know what I'm doing here. Right, whilst I would have assumed that Quake Free Arena for the Dreamcast would have a um, copy of Windows CE on it for 
developing, you know, would make sense to port Quake from Windows to the Dreamcast using that. Um, I can't remember if it does at the moment, but I do know that Sega Rally 2 does use Windows CE. So let's put this into the drive. I've put it onto, um, I've put it into the European region. So let's put this onto the, into the drive and then boot the GD-ROM. So to do that on the PC software, I'm just clicking on the boot from GD-ROM and then boot Dreamcast. And this should. I absolutely love that. So there you go, this I know is boot uh, running Windows CE. Um, and yeah, so there you go, we've got a Windows CE kernel detected and it says that the CD-ROM has been mounted. I wonder if we get a command line. I'm gonna turn that down a bit. No, so maybe all the debugging functions have been disabled here, which would make sense, but yeah, it won't give us any response, which is a shame. I, I mean, to be expected, but still interesting. The other thing that I want to talk about was the reason that the GDM PCB wasn't showing up or wasn't working within Windows 98. Originally I thought it was a Windows 98 and Aspie issue, so I was going to install Windows 2000, but then I realized that 2000 is not compatible with the Katana dev kit, so then I was almost about to install Windows NT, and then when I was reading the manual, it specifies that you need to use a specific SCSI card, or at least they recommend a specific SCSI card, which is this model here. Now I don't have that model, in fact, I was using this SCSI card. This is a Adaptec Ultra SCSI card. It's a 19160 or 29160N SCSI card. Um, but apparently, it's not compatible with the Katana due to the way the um, drive emulator is because the GDM PCB is emulating a 4 gig SCSI drive, but both the GDM PCB and the PC can read and write to the same hard drive at the same time. So the GDM PCB is actually arbitrating access to the drive at any given time. So I don't have the SCSI card that Sega recommended. So I ended up just looking around in one of my old uh, G4 Macs and it turned out it had, and it had some SCSI card from about the mid uh, 1990s. And that seems to work fine. So I have the Katana booted up. I've also got Windows 98 booted up and I wanted to show you this SCSI card that I'm using. And it's basically a Symbios Logic 875 XSID uh, 228X PCI SCSI adapter. But it does work with the Katana and the GDM system. So I've kept it in there. As you can see, we've got the Katana dev kit there, but under disk drives now, you'll see the CPL GDM. Now this is the, like I said, it's the arbitrating system. So this is emulating a four gig SCSI drive to Windows 98. And that's how it allows you to upload whole game images. Now, everyone will probably be thinking, well, what was on the drive if there was anything at all? And I do have good news. There was some files on the drive labeled Woody DC. Now, as you can see, I've got them on my desktop um, because even though I made the image with uh, Clonezilla, I did, because now the drive is working in Windows, I can just browse the drive like a normal SCSI drive. But I wondered what the heck Woody DC was. I was asking my friend, uh, does this ring a bell to you? I was asking a few other places, does this make any sense? Because if we go into the Woody DC folder, um, we'll see we've got Brazil, Chile, Game, Dirt, Not Head, Sound, there's loads of things, Wally, uh, Woody, and then NASCAR. And I'm thinking to myself, how does this make any sense? What is this? Well, this is a beta version of, well, what would have been Woody Woodpecker Racing. Uh, for the Dreamcast. At least I believe that's the case because it was made by a, a London studio. Um, so this is possibly where some of that those files have come from. But that's kind of where the good news ends because although we have these files, I can't boot it on the Katana. And there's two reasons for that. Reason one is because of GD Workshop. 
And what I mean by that is if we go into GD Workshop, you load up project files and then that's what sets up the emulation parameters. So at the moment we are using just the built-in GD ROM reader. But what we could do is if we opened up a CD project file, let's say, well, I'll, I'll go on to why this says Woody DC2. But if we go on to that, you can see that we have our GD-ROM image, which has both the single density CD-ROM area of a GD-ROM disc and the high density area of the actual GD-ROM portion of the disc. This is where you get some like your abstract files. Sometimes they have like wallpapers or something like that in the data area. Then um, track two is going to be your um, CDDA um, warning to say, basically it's a Dreamcast game. Don't put this in a CD player. And then you've got basically uh, padding and then the same tr CD track, which is a warning. Don't ask me why there's these two here. I don't quite understand, but that's just part of the GD-ROM specification. Track five is the actual game data. And you see, I've loaded up uh, Woody Woodpecker into um, this data portion. So all of these files are already uploaded onto the Katana's internal hard drive. So what we can do is we can switch from the GD-ROM, the physical GD-ROM drive to using the GDM emulator PCB and load up these files. But let me show you why I'm kind of disappointed. So now we've got the project files loaded on there and the files are uploaded, I should be able to load up what I hope it is Woody Woodpecker Racing. Now, when I change it to the internal emulator using um, GD Workshop, you'll notice that the disk drive LED goes off. So obviously when the disk drive light is solid, that means you're using the internal drive. And when it's not, you're using the emulator PCB. So if we now use GD Workshop to close the GD ROM drive door, um, the dev kit will start loading up all the files using the um, emulator PCB. And I can go to play and click play. The problem is, That's as far as it goes. Um, it loads two files and then it, it, it crashes. So because I don't have the original project files for the CD-ROM emulation system, I've had to rebuild the image um, using the files from the Dreamcast hard drive. The problem with that is um, I don't have the initial program loader. So what I've done is I've gone into um, the dev kit folder you have this IP maker the, in, the initial program maker so using this I did try to recreate what I think the game would have used to boot and that's why I've even gotten this far um, to boot in it but nothing I set in here makes this game work one of the other things I did try to do was use a initial program or a boot sector from a commercial retail game to see if that was also the issue but again that didn't work so Although I've got all of the files off the Dreamcast, I don't know if this is bootable. And you might think to yourself, okay, well, why don't you use the Codescape debugger to find out what's going on? Well, I do. I try, I've tried to do that. And what ends up happening is it gets to this software break and it just, it crashes. I don't know if there's a file missing from the hard drive. I don't know if that the game files that are on here just has some horrible bug that causes it to crash immediately upon loading. I don't know, it just, I can't get um, Woody Woodpecker Racing to actually boot. At least I think that's what Woody Woodpecker is. And that's kind of another problem that I have. Although I've got all of the um, files off the Dreamcast, I don't know if this is bootable, um, unfortunately. I will, however, put both the raw drive image, or at least the um, Clonezilla image of the drive, onto archive.org and I will also have the files available on archive.org and I'll put the link to those files into the description but I've tried this for these files on Flycast and I've tried this on Redream they both crash so it's beyond my ability to get that working unfortunately and this is also kind of really sad because that's probably what's on this disc this disc has got some burnt data on there, um, but we saw that this disc doesn't want to boot. Um, and what's really annoying is this probably has a working version of Woody Woodpecker's racing on here, 
And the reason I couldn't get it to boot, unfortunately, can you see that? The disc is actually cracked. Now, I reviewed the footage that I took originally of um, this disc going into the Katana the first time I tried it. And yeah, you can just about see the crack was there. It doesn't want to work anymore. The other problem is um, the crack goes through a portion, uh, like a portion of the data area, which definitely goes through the table of contents, but I don't know if you could extract the secondary table of contents on the high density section of the disc and then, you know, recover the data that way. So this will be going back to my friend. Um, he is aware of this. I did let him know. But yeah, that's unfortunately kind of a sad tale. So hopefully someone can do something with these files and get something that's playable. Now, one of the things I did want to do was to show the GD-ROM emulator PCB working. So what I've done is I've actually made another GD-ROM um, project file and I've labeled it Sonic 2. Now, Dreamcast Sonic 2. I'll let you have a guess as to what this is. And yeah, it's definitely loading from the hard drive because there's absolutely no disk in the drive. In fact, the Katana doesn't care whether I've got the drive open or closed. So it's running this game entirely from the internal hard drive at the moment, which means that like, you can load any retail game onto the Katana and play it like a really expensive and over-engineered um, ODE or optical drive emulator. And what you'll be able to see is that there's constantly read access going from the drive. It's telling you what it's loading and what, um, you know, how it's going. So at the moment it's loading eQuart.adx. And so this is the actual BGM music for um, this level because this game uses the ADX format to, um, you know, play background music. What also is nice about this is you can emulate um, read errors. So you've got one in 10,000 reads, there might be an error, one in 1000, one in 100, so on and so forth. So if the disc was really badly damaged, you could set that to one in 100 and every 100 reads there's going to be an error that comes up. And the reason you do this is so that your file loading routines um, would actually be resilient to any errors on the disc if it was badly scratched. So at the moment you can hear that the game is playing fine because it doesn't actually need, um, you know, it's handling the errors on the disc quite nicely. But if we were to, let's say, put that up to one in 10, that means it's a really badly damaged disc and we should start to see a lot more errors. Yeah, you hear the ADX music stopped now because it's getting so many issues with the um, read errors. So if we now exit out when it's on a really bad damaged disc, you'll see it probably will um, not be able to load the next file. Um, in fact, the game's now crashed properly because it can't load the from the GDU drive. So yeah, that's GD Workshop working with the GDM PCB working on the Katana to emulate a whole GD ROM drive. Now, you don't have to just use the internal hard drive. In fact, Sega say you can attach other SCSI drives um, that work with the Katana if you attach it to the GD Writer uh, SCSI port, I believe. Um, it's quite a useful bit of kit just to be able to, you know, have as much storage as you need and be able to emulate the drive. 
So yeah, at the moment, this is now just a really over-engineered and really over-the-top Dreamcast. In fact, I can now turn off the um, Windows 98 PC and now we can just play Sonic Adventure like it's a um, regular game. Heading due south over the city. We're en route. Everything's a go. This is Control Tower. We have you on radar. Report cargo status of captured Hedgehog aboard. Over. Attention all units. Suspects seen heading south. Have all major roads and capture the suspect. So yeah, I think that's about all I really want to cover with the Katana because, I mean, there's a lot... This is only scratching the surface of what it could all do. And there's a lot more that I could show, but I'm not the best person to talk about it. Um, I just wanted to show you the Katana, the overview of it, what it was capable of and what it kind of allowed you to do. And it's a really competent and capable dev kit. I don't know whether they're all like this, but this to me feels like it'd be a real easy piece of hardware to use and work with given what it's able to do and how it's able to emulate all of the um you know emulate the gd roms use real discs burn discs to send out to other places the amount of debugging capabilities that are available within the um, katana dev system uh, the only annoyance is that it doesn't work with windows 2000 which at the time that this came out was well, I wouldn't, it was as popular as Windows 98, I guess, but, um, you know, still, it was quite popular. Because um, this dev kit, I tried to boot it with Windows 2000, and it, it Windows 2000 just constantly hung. It could not, um, I never got it to boot uh, fully to the desktop, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's all I kind of wanted to cover with it, and, you know, just to show it, off what it was capable of and like I say even though we couldn't get um, the original game oh we're still going even though we couldn't get the original um, hardback game files that were on there to boot um, I will keep a link up on archive.org for as long as I don't get DMCA for it and uh, yeah hopefully someone else can make use of those files but yeah anyway thank you for joining me and if you don't mind i'm going to continue to play this because as cheesy as it is i absolutely love sonic adventure 2. hey guys take care